So then welcome back. Um, so we will dis, uh, continue with our journey through research methods in, in decision neuroscience. So from the last week, so from the last week, um, we talked about first a few. So the first one is behavior analysis. Behavior is the very important thing, is the first important thing to look at. So only when we have a meaningful um, behavioral readout from the experiments, either from human, from animal, then we could have a meaningful interpretation of the brain mechanism. So behavior is the, the only important thing so far um, that we uh, focused a little bit. And uh, actually, if you consider um, behavior, as I mentioned already, behavior analysis or behavior readouts applies to nearly every species. If you study neuroscience, you could focus. Some people have their own, own focus of the specific species. So people do human research, psychologists usually do human research, and there are human neuroscientists, and there are a larger community of other um, animal species when working on neuroscience, for example, um, primates, monkeys, and uh, rats, mouse, uh, house, uh, mouse, <laughs> and, um, uh, and zebra fish is almost also one of them. So zebra fish is a quite special and unique, um, let's say animal, because the brain is nearly transparent. So you could uh, like the skin and the skull is nearly transparent. And then you could easily record neuron recordings if, if the zebra fish is doing anything. So zebra fish is pretty interesting uh, in neuroscience. And uh, there are also people who study birds. So birds, usually um, the behavior is the sound, like this, let's say the singing of the birds. And the bird sounds is really interesting um, area to look into. So how birds communicate and how birds, the, the pitch and also uh, the frequency of the, the bird sounds is related to some of the behavior, which is only specific to them, to, the, to their species. This is very interesting. So um, moving on from behavior, what we have. So we have also um, studied, we have also the approaches um, to study like physiology and we could record for instance heart rate variability we could record like the facial emg and then there could also be the skin contactants to measure the people's people's response to threat like fear and some emotion um, arousal for instance and there could also be the saliva cortisol and so on and so forth and then we moved on to a bunch of a summary of a bunch of neuroimaging methods and all of these neuroimaging methods that I show you on these slides, they vary on two dimensions. So the x-axis is the time, and the, the y-axis is the is the, um, is the spatial position. Precision. So here, the x-axis measures or quantifies how fast each neuroimaging method is able to measure, and on the y-axis is showing how small, spatially, how small each neuroimaging method is able to measure. So the first one that we uh, talked about is single neuron recording. So the idea is that there will be some device that is directly attached to a field, a area of neurons, and then to directly record the activity of the neuron. So what you could imagine is that this method is really um, temporarily precise because you are basically a, a recorded directly from the brain. Spatially, it is a little bit limited because you will have a, you will need to have a a priori hypothesis regarding where you're gonna do the recording, right? So you might do it in the uh, frontal cortex, the, um, the, the forward area, the front area of the, of the brain. You might also go a little bit deeper to record neuron from from a little bit uh, deeper, deep brain, mid brain. And uh, there is so far, I'm not sure, I'm not really so aware of the animal literature, I, but so far, as far as I know, there is not really a neuron, a direct neuron recording that applies to the whole brain. I, I think, I don't think this is available yet. 
And uh, if, for instance, for animals, if you are interested in the whole brain of the animal, what do you do? Well, actually, you could also do MRI scan scanning. Uh, when we when we introduce MRI scanning, I will also talk about that a, li that a little bit. So how we could record or scan the brain using MRI machine for animals, but not, not the same one that we use, a, li a different one for animals. <clears throat> All right, and uh, yeah, so the previous one is the single neural recording for um, um, rodents, and then this one is for primates. And one thing to pay attention to is that single neuron recording doesn't mean we record only one neuron each time. This is rarely possible because neurons are so tiny, and each device, if we put it there, even like a single um, is with, 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 the, with the thickness of a hair, even something like that, if we could be able to as small as that, as tiny as that, that will still record lots of thousands of neurons. So single neuron recording is only mean that you focus on a single area. It doesn't mean you record only single neuron. Okay, just pay attention to the terminology. <clears throat> and um, uh, we talked about a little bit of the advantages and disadvantages, and then we moved to the next. And the next one is brain lesion. So brain lesion, um, so lesion means we just destroy it, but brain lesion doesn't mean we destroy the brain. So brain lesion means we will focus on the special population or patients where the brain is damaged for some reason. So it might be a generic um, reason, it might be some accidents, it might be different reasons. So anyway, as researcher or as clinicians, usually they have to go to the doctor, right? neurologist, and then the neurologist, they find out, okay, this patient is unfortunately somewhere of the brain is damaged. So then usually, well, people have to treat, treat it to help the, the, the doctors. They want to heal or to treat the patient. This is for one thing. But there is also the opportunity for research, usually in this regard. So um, brain lesion patients is rare. Usually don't find it so much. And... Um, Another reason for the rare, rare rareness is, so if you see here from the last time, the, the, the brain lesion, the damage to the area in amygdala is just so perfect in the way that only amygdala is damaged and nowhere else. But usually in the more common cases, brain lesion um, patients, their area um, of the le least well, lesion I don't know the word, destroyed area is diffused. It's not so, it's not so focused. So if you're able to find like something like this, only the amygdala is damaged, or maybe if you, there is a recent paper from a few months ago, so only the prefrontal cortex is damaged. That's really valuable to do some research. And then in fact, that paper from a month ago, they only reported um, one single patient. So usually if you find if you could, if you are able to find a patient like this or like that, with a focused area of brain lesion, brain damage, then one person or one, one case study is, 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 is enough. And usually if you publish this kind of paper, you don't really, you do not only report one patient. The patient sample is n equals one, this is fine, but you will have a relatively reasonable number of a healthy control to do the comparisons, maybe 20 or 30 as, an, as, our, as our normal sample size. <clears throat> so here, uh, last time we talked about how amygdala lesion patients is having some difficulties in recognizing some negative emotions, for instance, here like surprise and afraid. And it turns out that using eye tracking, so this is a combination between brain lesion, brain lesion and process tracking methods, eye tracking, to find out that, so for healthy control, people tend to use the, the eyes as a cue to identify, um, to recognize emotions. And for these amygdala damaged patients, and uh, they um, look a little bit differently. So they look at the nose and the mouth, or maybe also the distance between the nose and the mouth. So here, something like this. And uh, yeah, as we said, brain lesions, patients, they're rare and the consequence the long-term and it can be compensated, probably can be uh, compensated by brain plasticity. There are some self-plasticity 
mechanisms of the brain development, especially if the brain damage happened during the early age of, for example, childhood, <clears throat> then usually they are, it can be compensated in a way to some extent. And brain lesion is a good way to do, uh, to deduct, to draw um, causal conclusions. Because if we say, if we want to demonstrate if A is the reason for B happening, so how to demonstrate that, we try to remove A and then to see if B is not happening. So that, that's usually the, the, the logic. So if let's say that this brain region is for this cognitive function, is if we remove this brain region area or for, for, for um, uh, using lesion patients, then if some of the behavior is not observable, it's not even there, it's not present, then we could be able to conclude that this area is the causal reason for some cognitive functions. For instance, recognizing emotion, for example, memorizing things. So there's a um, um, hippocampus lesion patients where some people have either long-term um, memory issues or short-term memory issues. <clears throat> Good. And then what's next? So for example, if we want to, we really want to have some causal relationship between brain area and some behavior, but we're not lucky enough to have a patient. So, so what, what can we do in this case? It turns out there that there are some methods to temporarily, temporarily destroy the brain function for a very short period of time and then it will restore. So it's like, um, if I apply this method and some area of the brain is not functioning as usual for maybe one hour, and then within this one hour, we can do experiments. And after the one hour and everything is back to normal. And then this kind of uh, method in general, it's called brain stimulation. So you stimulate that certain area of the brain and then to see how behavior changes, how brain connectivity changes, and there are, as I said, multiple um, types of brain stimulation and using different technologies from physics, from uh, thanks to the development of physics. And there are first, this one is transcranial magnetic stimulation. There is a magnetic field. So using the magnetic field to disturb the neural circuits of certain brain area. So then, uh, for instance, there is kind of this is a uh, this is called I think eight figure coil. But this entire thing is called it's called a coil because the shape is the same as number eight, the number digit. So this is called a number eight, whatever the coil. And then, if let's say the coil is placed at this area of the brain. So with a small area, not so much, it's rather small. So this area, the activity can be changed. So there are two ways to do TMS. So you could imagine if you want to change the area of the brain, so how, how you can change it. You either make it more, it, it, you could make it go up or to make it go down, right? Using the neuroscience terminology, we could make it more excitatory or maybe inhibitory. So either the activity go up or go down. But usually if you go to the literature, using TMS to enhance the activity is usually quite questionable. So TMS is good. It's much better to destroy the area rather than accelerate it. So using TMS, usually we achieve a non-invasive kind of virtual uh, lesion of the brain to, to study the causal relationship. Okay. <clears throat> so um, there is one example, and I don't want to talk about it too much. And the idea here is that we focus on an area called here, the DLPFC is called dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. So it's like the, the side here, something like this place, a little bit above the eyes, but a little bit um, side. So this is uh, lateral, the lateral area, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. So this area from even previous studies has been demonstrated to be related um, to something like um, um, 
uh, in, in this task of um, related to accept, uh, accept, acceptance rates. So what is that? The task I have to explain it a little bit. So this is a decision-making game. And there are two players, me and you, for instance. And I have 10 euro, for example, in the beginning. And you have nothing. And I make an offer to you. So I keep nine euro to myself. I give you one. Or maybe I keep eight, I give you two. I keep five, I give you five. Or if I if or, or maybe it can be that I'm generous, I only keep six, and then I don't know, I give uh, I keep four, and I give you six, so you get more than me. So my offer to you is either generous or selfish. Okay. So people would say that as a from the theory of economics, economics. If you are a rational person, as long as you receive some money, it's better than nothing, right? So if I give you one and then I keep nine, it's pretty self it's, it's, it is pretty selfish to me. You still get one euro, but one euro to yourself is still better than nothing. But people usually don't behave this way. So they behave a little bit towards fairness because if you receive one euro and I receive nine, you think this is not a fair offer, you will, you will uh, uh, reject it. You don't think this is a good offer. And your rejection is also a signal that for me, probably the next time I will have to change it a little bit. Maybe I give you two instead of one, instead of one. maybe I give you three instead of two. So then there is kind of a balance there is some point that you will say, okay, now it's fine, I accept this offer, okay? So it's kind of the story. So the brain area, DLPFC, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is related to the acceptance rate um, from previous study. But dorsal lateral um, uh, prefrontal cortex is bilateral. It's, it's, it's located in the, on the right hemisphere and also the left hemisphere. And there are two sides of the brain. It's kind of symmetrical. And people, and previous researchers, they found about the bilateral two sides of the DLPFC is related to the acceptance rate of this behavior. And then they want to say, well, which area, which side is more responsible to um, the behavior? So left or right? And how to do it, we could find the DLPFC brain lesion patients, but we can't, then we could apply um, the transcranial magnetic stimulation technique, the TMS. So you stimulate either here or here. There is also a control group where the stimulation doesn't really do anything. So here that's the sham. From the graph, you see, well, I could either stimulate the left hemisphere, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, or the right, or just not doing anything, the control condition, okay? And then you will see that while well, stimulating uh, the right one is really make it, it, that, uh, it really makes a change because the left is more or less the same as the control, and then the right is higher than the other two conditions. So this is a way to find, to establish some causal relationship between the DLPFC and the acceptance behavior in this task. Good, I think there are some questions probably. Is in the area disabled for a second and next? Yeah, so this is a good question from Florian. Um, let me change it a little bit. So the idea is that so TMS is not um, so there is not only one way to do TMS. There are sequences. So the TMS can be like da 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 da, da can also be da 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 something like this. The sequence of the TMS, and each of the sequence of the TMS will have a different an outcome when it is applied to the brain. And then there are two ways of doing TMS. One is called online TMS. The other way is called offline TMS. So online TMS means 
as long as I stimulate, I would assume there are some function, function changes in the brain. If I don't stimulate, then it's gone. So this is, I guess, the question, right? If I stimulate maybe two seconds, and then if I turn it off, nothing's gonna happen. Okay, good. But if I want to continuously um, affect the behavior, affect the brain, so how should I do? I just keep it here and throughout the entire experiment. So maybe if, I, if my experiment is 30 minutes, so then the TMS will just be here for 30 minutes. This is online TMS. So that the, the entire period of, this, of the experiment, the TMS will be functioning. Okay, this is one way. There's another way, it's called offline, offline TMS. So what, what does that mean? So offline TMS means it is uh, applied in the beginning of the experiment. And then during the experiment, the TMS is not there. So it's offline relative to the experiment. And now you could ask, <laughs> offline TMS, does that work? How does that work? So it turns out that there is a um, specific sequence that I showed you, that, da, 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 something like that. And you, if you apply that very in a very short period of time for around 40 seconds, and then the effect will last for around 30 to 40 minutes. And if your experiment is short enough to be within 40, 30 and 40 minutes, then you could just do it, okay? Offline TMS. Good. Yeah, okay, I guess this, this explanation answered quite a few of your questions. Does that harm the brain at all? Uh, there's no evidence that this is harming the brain, no. So during the experiment, yes, a bit so changing, disturbing the neural activity, but that doesn't, doesn't really harm anything. <laughs> short from the effect no okay i think i answered that if you keep turning off the brain for minutes to hours it might do damage though I, i'm not sure yeah it de depends on the method yeah well let, 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 let's, let's put this way so tms one um property or attribute is the pulse like da, 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 da. the other one is that the magnitude is the strength so if there is a coil, it is, there's something with me. So there's, if, let's say this is a coil and then it, it is attached to the brain, right? The surface of the brain, it's, there's the, the pause, there is the strength, like how strong that is. Um, it, if that's too strong, I think you're right, then there will be some negative effect. So the question now is how to determine the strength. So it turns out that there is a method to calibrate the strength per person. So maybe strength on a hypothetical scale, one to 10, maybe I can tolerate um, eight, but eight for you is too strong, right? So there is a, um, a people-specific strength that is functioning for everyone because we can also call that individual difference. So how to determine this? individualize the threshold. So usually people will uh, use a method to find out um, what is the minimum amount of magnetic strength to activate the motor area, the motor area. So we know that the brain is organized in a way that some part of the body is mapped. There is a, there is a corresponding area in the brain. So there is like, if a, um, a motor area, a hand area, a finger area, a feet area, something like that. Maybe you heard that there's a motor area. And then the motor area is organized in a way that it is corresponding to body parts. Um, so for experienced experimenters, they will be very easily locate the finger area of the person and then to apply a strength to the finger area to see if the finger like changes, like twists, something like this. If I if the, this my finger area is is, stim, is stimulated, then you will see a spontaneous and uncon, un, unconscious uh, movement of the finger, something like this. People will use the smallest, slow, uh, smallest or the lowest strength of the TMS to be able to activate the finger, and then this is the um, the acceptable strength of TMS and don't go larger than that. This is the idea, I think.
Another question is, I think, um, can you know for sure how long the effect will last in, 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 on, in offline TMS? No, this is a difficult question. So uh, if I apply this 40 seconds repetitive TMS offline in the beginning of the experiment, some people the effect will be maybe 30 minutes, some people 40, some maybe longer. So even uh, people who are really in the field, they cannot give you an answer. This changes a lot from people, from person to person. So this, there's no exact answer for that. <clears throat> so how strong is the effects? Can I, for example, disable the motor functions or view of a person? I think that would work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not really sure. I'm not, really sure. I'm, not, I'm not so much an expert in this area. Maybe it's worth checking the literature. <clears throat> All right, other questions? Yeah, so TMS is one method of brain stimulation using magnetics. And then you are smart enough and you would imagine that, well, magnetic is related to the current, electric, electric, electricity, right? Electronic, ele electricity. So is there a way to also stimulate uh, the brain using that method. There, the answer is yes. There is a, like a sister kind of method, which is called TDCS. So it's called transcranial direct current like using electricity um, to stimulate the brain. So the area uh, of the brain is being simulated is like, depends on your research hypothesis. And uh, for example, this is a picture showing a people, a group of people who are doing a group experiment. So they, there are some social, social interaction among these participants. And then this is the device of the TDCS and that they are sitting in front of the computer to do some tasks. And uh, yeah, that's um, um, for TDCS, there is one um, quite special difference relative to the TMS. So the TMS, I told you that to act, to make the brain more activated is rather questionable in TMS. So usually people use TMS to downregulate the brain rather than upregulate. But for TDCS, so usually people could really go both ways. You can go up, you can go down. So here is, I don't want to explain the task too much. So just want to show you the effects. So here, um, this is the TMS. It can be uh, anodal, it can be sham, it's, uh, it can be a cathode. Uh, I forgot which is which, but the idea is why is upregulate the other ones, downregulate. And you can see here, this is related to different um, behavior. So for one, this is increased, the other one is decreased, and then there's the opposite. You can read the paper a little bit more. So, but the idea I want to show is that for TDCS, it can really go both ways. Um, there is something a little bit new and that is not even included in the slides. I can't find anything so nice yet. And uh, so this new method is called ultrasound stimulation. It's basically using ultrasound to stimulate the brain. And uh, because ultrasound, this method is really new and uh, it hasn't yet be, been established so well in human. So usually if you look at literature, ultrasound stimulation is used quite often in animals, I would say already, but in humans, it's not yet there. Uh, not, not so many people. I think some people in, um, Oxford and in in the um, in Lausanne, the other one, the other technical university in Lausanne in Switzerland, and then also in the Netherlands, I think there are a group of people. So they are this ultra. There is the ultrasound special group because they also want to apply this method to human, right? They, they are developing this. So let's see. I'm really looking forward to the development of ultrasound brain stimulation in humans <clears throat> because so the reason is like like this. TMS and TDCS, if you use this method to stimulate the brain, you could only imagine that this method will change a little bit the surface, the cortical area of the brain. It doesn't go deep. 
this is a dis disadvantage, right? If, for example, I want to stimulate midbrain dopamine related areas, striatum in the brain, this either TMS or TDCS, it doesn't work. So TMS, TDCS, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. So TMS only reaches relatively approximately two, two centimeters from, from the surface to, um, to a little bit down. So if you apply this area and then only within two centimeters, you can reach. But the brain is definitely not something that can be covered within two centimeter, right? There are something deeper. So if you want to steep, uh, stimulate deeper, either TMS or TCS doesn't work. <clears throat> so ultra brain, uh, ultrasound brain stimulation on the, other hand, on the other hand can actually achieve deeper resolution. So that's why the reason I'm really looking forward to the development. And then there's kind of another method It's kind of using double uh, TMS coil. So this is an eight figure coil. Let's say this reaches two centimeter. And some people claim that this is not so much developed also. They, they say, well, let's use two and then they work together. Maybe we can reach deeper. I think it works in some case, but it's not so, uh, reliable, I would say. So just keep in mind all those methods. Some questions. Um, the, the, the procedure using lower of TDCS using a low, lower voltage than electroconvulsive therapy. I'm not sure. I, I don't know. I'm sorry. Yeah, but this brings a new question. Um, that so TMS and TDCS, they are not only brain stimulation method to do research, you can also do this for therapeutic reasons. And I'm not sure the details. So I, 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 I'm aware that using TMS stimulation could change some behavior of depression patients. So they come to the therapy, to the clinic, and then they do a little bit 10 minutes TMS, and then they go home. Next week, they come again, it's like therapy. It's like, like taking medicine. This works for some drugs that this if you imagine that, if you would imagine that TMS or TDCS will work for therapeutic reasons, you really need to have a strong hypothesis. You need to know which area is more related to the behavior of the patient. And if you stimulate, then how and what is the, the frequency, the sequence to stimulate? Then this requires a, a collaboration between researchers and also clinicians, doctors. Some other questions, I guess, are interested. So we are shock the temporal lobe. Uh, is ultrasound the same thing as ultrasonic? Yes, this one, I think so. Also, how precise is this method? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, this is new. I don't know. <clears throat> So there is a researcher, um, I'm not even sure if I can spell his name correctly. But I type in the chat, you can just Google him. Maybe we will also correct my spelling. So Matthew Rashford is a professor in Oxford and he is really a, a D researcher quite one of the most important researchers in decision neuroscience, honestly. So he does research both in human and animals, especially in, in monkeys, prime, non-human primates. And he uses all of the methods, fMRI, EEG, and MEG, you will just hear from me. And he also uses brain stimulation. He's one of the first person, for, he's one of the first people who use the TMS in brain study, in brain research. And recently he switched also to this ultrasound, ultrasonic methods in monkeys. And I believe that he, will, if you see human research using ultrasonic, ultrasonic, ultrasound brain stimulation, I really bet it will be coming from Matthew Brasworth. <clears throat> Follow his research. I think you will have a deeper understanding. And I think two, two years ago, maybe one year ago, um, there is a kind of a method paper introducing this ultrasound brain stimulation also from Matthew Rashford, of course. Let's take a look. I think that's worth checking. Okay. 
All right, uh, let's take a look at the comparison of the two methods and, and also in general, this non-invasive non brain stimulation because you do not really need to do operation of the brain, you just do non-invasive brain stimulation. Um, so it, it can be transient, it can be long-term, but long-term, not so long, not a, a day or two, but maybe something, right? It depends on the sequence. So that you, you use a specific sequence to change the duration of the effect. And it is, it is also a way to establish causal relationship between brain area and behavior, right? Brain lesion is one way, non-invasive brain stimulation is another way. And uh, TMS and TDCS, I said, well, it's difficult to stimulate deep brain, mid brain, it can't go deeper. But with the new development of, of ultrasound, ultrasonic, brain stimulation, I guess there will be some really new and exciting development. If that is something reliable in the future, I will just also include that in my slides for future. <clears throat> and then there are some like loud sound effects and some muscle related issues for some people. So the idea here is usually you, if, you, if your stimulation is so close to the eye and so close to the, to the skin, people will not feel so comfortable. And this will be a confound to experiments. So usually people try also now to stimulate the, the frontal area because they're so close to the eye and the forehead. And people usually like stimulate, for instance, motor cortex is one of the most stimulated brain areas in TMS. And uh, there is also, um, there's the area called TPJ, temporal parietal junction. So some people ask the temporal, um, uh, lobe that's possible stimulates because TPJ is the area that we know um, is related to social functioning, like theory of mind, for instance. So people really focus on TMS a lot, especially for social neuroscientists. And a few years ago, maybe 2007, anyway, so there is a paper. This is a review paper, really encouraging reading that. So it introduce is kind of also summarizes and combines different methods of brain stimulation. And uh, it's worth taking a look. Uh, questions, other thoughts? Then let's talk about EEG and MEG. So the, there's a reason why I just combined these two methods together to give you the introduction. <clears throat> so the EEG, um, so both of the EEG and MEG, the assumption is like this. So the brain, if the brain is working and the way that works is to, there are neurons, right? The neurons, they basically talk to each other in a way that we heard from movies and also from, from textbooks and how they talk to each other. And there's something called synapse. And then there's also something called um, action specs. So the neuron specs, they specs, and uh, there will be some intrinsic electric activity generated from brain activation. So basically we could measure that, right? So one way to measure is to directly measure the current that is generated from the brain. The other idea is we know from physics that if there's current, there's also a related small tiny magnetic field. We could also, we, we could also measure the associated magnetic field. So that's the reason of the two methods. So one is directly measure the, the, directly measure the current. The other one is to measure the current that is associated um, one EEG is to directly measure the current. The other one, the MEG, is to measure the magnetic field generated from the current. Okay, both are from the brain, of course. So here, basically, if I just give you the introduction, you will see um, 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 <clears throat> uh, the meaning. So here, how this direction works, there's a little bit too much detail. I think we don't even have to, to worry about that. We just remember one is to measure the electric activity. The other one is to measure the magnetic field produced by that 
electric activity. Okay. Then it comes to the question about if we are measuring the electrical activity from the cortical area, the surface of the brain, how could we interpret anything that is happening a little bit deeper? So this is one of the, uh, the reasons that we are saying EEG doesn't really have a so precise spatial resolution. However, MEG does. There, the, in, uh, later there will be a comparison between MEG and EEG, but let's first look at one simple experiment. And very briefly, I think because you will see this in the, in the presentation, so I guess I'll just only uh, briefly talk about that. This is an easy decision-making task. There are two choice options. One is left, the other one is right. And then you make a choice, which one you think that you will get more reward. And then the number out here does not relate, relate it, does not directly relate it to the reward. Otherwise, you will just choose 25, which is larger, right? And uh, then making after making the choice, people in this way choosing left, for example, they will see the outcome. And the outcome means uh, here they have a 25 unit of winning and also five unit of losing indicated by the color and then they learn and then make a decision and then people could also record uh, the brain activity using EEG in this particular case and then they found out there the difference in the brain area in the mid uh, anterior, anterior cingulate cortex a little bit so there's a difference uh, like around 200 milliseconds after the stimulation onset there is a difference between gain and loss. So people just want to find when people receive gain versus when they receive loss, is there anywhere in the brain shows a difference in terms of brain um, EEG signal. So this is the finding. <clears throat> and uh, EEG is a cheap experiment. So if you would claim that you want to do human research, human neuroimaging neuro research, but you don't have so much budget, one, good start is to start with EEG because that's cheap. The other one is MEG. The MEG is like, this machine is large and it occupies, I think, around um, three, minute, three meter by three meter kind of space, I think. I think, I'm not sure. And then there's also a room, right? The room is even larger. <clears throat> MEG is more expensive as well. And then the comparison uh, here, at least a few, and uh, we don't have to look at all of them. So let's say the signal magnitudes, and then this is a large signal, easy to detect by EEG. Usually the MEG here, even though that's quite expensive, the signal that can be detected by the machine is actually pretty tiny. So you will have to have a better task to induce a reliable effect so that you will be able to detect the signal. And then the cost, I said already, the EEG is cheap and EEG expensive. And then there are some interesting parts, especially here, the temporal resolution. And both are pretty good, so they are pretty fast. They direct, uh, they, um, they measure either the electrical, ele electric activity or the magnetic field generated from there. The temporal resolution is very fast. And from the figure that I showed you from last slides, we could be able to find out like millisecond by millisecond changes using the EEG and also the MEG methods. And in terms of the spatial resolution, uh, so the EEG is not so good, so it's centimeter, and uh, the MEG is better, so millimeter. It can go be it, it can go a little bit smaller. Okay, and then there are some others. Uh, it's fine. So this knowledge, like EEG, MEG, the one I showed you, maybe I think you heard, of that, heard about that before. And are there any new um, advancements or developments? The answer is yes. So nowadays, what is interesting to uh, develop in terms, in terms of the technology is that there is the mobile method. There's wireless EEG, for example, there's a cap, you take it, there is a signal that can be transmitted to uh, the server, for example, using Bluetooth, internet. I'm not really sure, but I guess that's this way, right? Wireless. And people can wear it. It just continuously measures the brain activity and people just can walk around. 
So you could do some sports, for example, and then you could go down to the street. If you see the traffic lights stop or to go, depends on if you see green or a light or right. And then people could be, all, be able to see how the visual input and is also uh, functioning through the brain. So the combination can be like you have a um, variable and mobile eye tracker, like a glass glasses. And the, at the same time, there is a mobile and variable uh, EEG at the same time. So people can just freely move around, right? Both of these methods will, will allow us to see the attention where they look at and also the brain activity using um, the EEG. This is pretty um, interesting because usually if we ask participants to do experiments, they come into the lab, they sit in front of the computer and then they press buttons, they don't move. And if they do this kind of MEG, for example, they will be explicitly instructed to not move. Otherwise, the moving will actually produce a strong um, artifact some noise to the signal. The signal is not strong already. If you produce a lot of noise, you will just measure nothing, right? You have to stay still. But this is what we not, what we not, this is not what we do every day. We move around, even though we are at home lockdown, but we are, we, we, we move, we cooking a little bit, we get something to drink, to eat, and we do some homework, I do some online teaching, and I move. This is our um, free moving, the real life situation. So people want to resemble that. So they developed wearable and um, wireless mobile measurement. There's also a method actually to measure mobile MEG. It's still a little bit funky. You wear something, it looks quite heavy, but this is becoming possible. I guess it's more and more possible in the future. All right. <clears throat> So then the next one is functional magnetic resonance imaging. So fMRI, uh, this is even a larger machine. It is also expensive. The, the price, uh, the, the cost is relatively the same as MEG. So EEG uh, is cheap. MEG and fMRI, MRI, they are expensive, roughly equally expensive. So, um, People don't stand in the MRI machine. They have to lay down and then they have to go inside the scanner. So the idea here is like this. There is a huge coil, this entire circle. This is a magnetic field. It can be 1.5 to the strength. It can be 1.5 Tesla. It can be three Tesla, it can be seven Tesla. So when MRI scanning um, is used, was used, to do human cognitive neuroscience research. In the beginning, it was 1.5 Tesla. And then nowadays, the standard is three Tesla, three T scanning. And uh, it's becoming, it's gradually shifting to 70 Tesla. So the advantage is if the magnetic field is stronger, so the signal to noise ratio that can be produced by this machine is also better. So we will be able to have a precise, much precise investigation into the brain. So that's the advantage of getting um, stronger and stronger. And I, I mentioned earlier that there is also the possibility to do MRI in animals, in rodents and in uh, the monkeys. This is too large for a rodent, right? For, for, for a mouse. So there is actually a smaller um, MRI machine. So the size, I think, it, it would be approximately as large as a um, fridge, I think. It's kind of like a fridge. You just lay it down, and then uh, that's more or less the size of a, of a rodent MRI machine. <clears throat> anyway, uh, we use MRI to measure brain activity. But what is really interesting and important to remember here is that MRI machine doesn't directly measure the brain activity. 
So if that doesn't measure brain activity directly, what does it measure? We use it a lot and we claim that we measure um, brain activity. What is actually happening when a person is being scanned in the fMRI machine? So the idea is that we, our brain is like a machine in a way that it, it consumes energy. So when the brain is more activated, it consumes um, oxygen relative to when it doesn't do so much. So with this assumption, we could measure the brain, uh, the brain oxygen dependence when, the, where and, when and where in the brain um, the amount of oxygen is more relative when they are doing a task relative to when they are not doing a task or maybe when they are doing task one relative to when they are doing task two. So here, the specific terminology is that the MRI machine, they measure the blood oxygenation level dependence. So this is called a bold, in short, a bold signal. If you read paper later in our lecture during your preparation for your um, talk, you will see the fMRI paper, all of them, they will mention their bold signal, bold signal. What does it mean? Bold signal here means the brain blood um, blood oxygen dependence. And if you use this here, the graph here, we could look at that a little bit. So the oxygen, the color is blue, okay? We don't really measure the activity in the neuron. We, make, we, we measure how much oxygen are there, molecules in the blood. So here we say, well, if we would be able to observe, there is not so much oxygen here in the blood when it, when it is rest. And then when the brain is more activated, because the brain will consume more oxygen, it will ask from the blood for the oxygen to be able to active. So here, the blue colored the oxygen, there are more, right? Then we could do a contrast, simple contrast. We contrast this condition relative to this condition. And then we say, this is indirect way of measuring the brain activation, okay? <clears throat> this is quite important to, to remember. So MRI machine also has um, quite a good spatial resolution. It can go millimeter by millimeter. So if we use three Tesla, three, three Tesla 3T scanner, so the smallest, most of the case, the smallest um, brain area to be covered is a three, two, I think two by two by two millimeter. It's a small cube. If we could be able to use seven Tesla, this can even go smaller. So it can go to one by one by one, one millimeter by one millimeter by one millimeter, even a smaller cube, right? <clears throat> And uh, there is a terminology, I think I will uh, explain it a little bit to you. So we know pictures, like if we take a picture and if we buy a camera, we also, we, own, we, we most of the time we care about the resolution of the picture that can be produced by the camera. So if this is a picture, what, what, is, a, a, uh, the pre, what is the measurement of the precision of the picture? How can we say if the quality is high relative to the quality is low? So we divide the picture into several spaces in both dimensions. And each of them here, we call it a voxel, uh, a pixel, sorry, we call it a pixel. And we the picture the size of the picture is the same so we can have a low resolution where the pixel is large we can have a high resolution when the pixel is small right so the pixel is kind of the way to measure the precision of a 2d space but the brain as we know it's a 3d space so what we do well it turns out that we could also divide the brain into this kind of small pieces. But rather than 
a two-dimensional thing, a square, we now do a small cube. So here, we will do a small cube. Oops, yeah, small cube. So the small cube, either one by one by one or two by two by two, doesn't matter the, the dimension, the size. Um, it, this is called a voxel, okay? This is a pixel in 2D space. This is a voxel. And then the voxel is the smallest measurement unit that, will, that we will be able to see in your um, paper reading and when you are preparing for the talks. So voxel is smallest measurement unit used by the MRI method, okay? Good. And now again, a question. So we know, let's say this is one by one by one, for example, this can be already the smallest one we are able to achieve in the world. How many neurons are there? Well, thousands, <laughs> it's a lot. Not that if we have a like thin, um, higher dimension, single neuron recording, we can be able to measure one neuron. It's not the case. We never record one neuron. We record the area of neurons here the same. The cube is small, but neuron is very much smaller. So we are still measuring a group of neurons inside that voxel. Yeah, there's a V, yes, voxel. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> so other questions? Yeah, it makes like sense. But I don't know why it's code box, so I actually have no idea. <laughs> so if you are doing masters here in our university, there is um, a Teva course, one semester really dedicated to analyzing fMRI data. So fMRI data, as you can see here, can be quite complex. There is a pipeline, entire workflow of analyzing the data. And if you are getting that point, actually really recommend uh, taking that course. <clears throat> okay, let's look at one simple experiment. And I also don't want to talk too much about that. So a uh, psychology master, mind and brain track. Um, the, 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 this experiment, I think it will also be part of the presentations. I will just really briefly talk about that. This is a food choice decision-making task. So there is a snack bar. You will decide if you like it or not. And then we could measure brain activity. It's very, very brief. So here in this case, those will be the pictures or figures, images that you will be able to see in the papers and articles describing the brain area of the brain. So usually there is kind of a brain as a template and we will see where is more activated, where is not, okay? So in this case, there are two areas. One is the medial orbital frontal cortex in the, like close to the eye. And then the other one is the one we saw it already. So dorsal lateral uh, brain activity. How does that relate to the behavior? What, why this is interesting or relevant? I think we will see that next week. So that's uh, part of the presentation. <coughs> So MRI um, is non-invasive. It has a good 3D resolution with the voxel one by one by one, for example. It is an indirect, this is really important to remember, is an indirect measurement. It doesn't measure brain activity. EEG, MEG, they do. So they measure either the electrical activity or the related magnetic field. They are, both of them, they are direct measurement of the brain activation. Here, it not, it's not. So MRI machine, it measures the brain um, relative. It, 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 it has an indirect measurement of the brain by using the blood oxygen dependency. So how much oxygen is in the blood that will be consumed by the brain, to be, to be consumed by the brain. Timing is kind of the biggest drawback of using MRI. So MEG, it can go like a second, second, one, one millisecond, one millisecond, one millisecond, but MRI here um, is slower. So it's one, one second is pretty fast already MRI, but most of the cases is 1.5 seconds or two seconds, okay? So 
how to how to imagine these things so what determines um the temporal resolution of a measurement so let's just go back one go back one step back go to one step back to think about what determines um the temporal resolution so spatial resolution i told you already if it really depends on the size of your measurement unit if you can go to 0.5 millimeter by 0.5 by 0.5 then you can even go deeper right much more precise in the spatial regard but what determines the temporal regard what is actually determining the temporal resolution is it, it turns out that there is a concept called sampling rate so how fast we are measuring that so it's like um when how can i give you a good example and maybe this is a bad example but let's see so if i want to take a picture of you and you are moving so let, 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 let's say there is this scenario okay i think this might make sense it's still not a good one but let me try <clears throat> so i want to take your movement you are for example dancing and why I, I, i'd like to record you but let's say i don't have a video camera i, I cannot record a video the video is really continuous and it moves perfect there's also also a sampling rate but let's forget about that instead i have only a camera it can only take pictures so to be able to um, <clears throat> to be able to capture your movements, I will have to take pictures continuously. I could take pictures every two seconds. I could take pictures every one second within one minute, for example. And then I will just concatenate the pictures. And if, if I uh, have the pictures there, and then I press left and uh, right, 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 right. And then it, it appears that you are dancing, right? So that's actually the early days, also nowadays, how to make uh, cartoons or animations. And if this temporal difference is so fast, it's fast enough, then your eyes, is that your eyes is cheating you, right? They are, all, they are nonetheless static images. But if the difference between one slice is fast or small, uh, relative to the next, your eyes won't be able to tell there's a like there's a delay or anything. It looks continuous. So this is the um, the key measurement to determine the temporal resolution. So this is called the sampling rate. How fast you are sampling it? How fast you are taking the picture of something that you are measuring? Are you taking every one second? This is a high frequency. Uh, are you taking one millisecond? This is a higher frequency. Or maybe if you are taking uh, uh, one uh, every five seconds, this is a smaller one or slower. I, I can draw something. I try to draw something to you. So let's say there is a continuous signal. The brain is a continuous signal, and you are dancing. Your movement it it is also a continuous signal, right? It doesn't stop at anywhere. Let's assume that we have a hypothetical continuous signal of whatever doesn't matter. So let's say this is a continuous signal. OK, good, continuous. So let's say that we want to measure this signal with a high sampling rate. So we have a high sampling rate of, for example, every, uh, one, every one second. It, so then it takes the measurement every one second. So on and so forth. And imagine if you draw a line to, to ask all of the uh, to, to ask your line to go through all of the blue dots, it will be more or less the same as the original red one, the original signal, right? This is good enough. But on the other hand, so let's assume that we have a low temporal resolution. I measure this activity maybe every 10 seconds. So this is my first dot. This is my second dot. This is my third. This is my fourth, right? So if you draw a line, well, it doesn't look nice. It doesn't really resemble the original shape of the signal, the red one. 
So here, this is the difference between a high temporal resolution and a low temporal resolution. MRI is a machine. Also, you could imagine that it's taking a picture of your brain. It takes a picture of your brain one second, and then at one time, and then two seconds later, it takes another picture, and then two seconds later, it takes another picture. It's just like that. But we know that neurons are acting so fast, it's like within milliseconds. Taking the brain picture every one second or two seconds is actually considered slow, okay? So this is the reason of that. So MRI is slow, in this case, slower. MEG and EEG, they are fast. So their sampling rate is like, so MRI is like the, the, the green one, for instance, this is MRI. And then the blue one is, uh, did I change the color? Is EEG, MEG. G. Yeah, this is faster, this is slower. <clears throat> and then the red one is the true one. And we're always trying to improve our sampling rate to improve our spatial resolution. And then the, the, the goal or the aim is always to be able to um, measure the brain as closely as possible. <clears throat> That's the time, okay, some time minutes left. Yeah, MRI is also kind of noisy. If you have taken, participated in one of the MRI experiments, so you go, you lay down in the scanner, and they usually give you a earplug because it's noise. So MRI is like, it's noisy. There are some sound you can Google, you can yeah, try to find some YouTube soundtrack. There's also the scanner sound. It's pretty, some people say that they like hearing that, but, but it's honestly noisy if you are hearing that for the first time. <clears throat> And also have some restrictions for the, for the subject. So one of them is basically the movement. If they lay down, if you lay down, if we imagine you lay down inside a scanner, you can't really move. Otherwise, it will produce too much noisy signal. <clears throat> and also the brain can't be too large. So there is a coil to measure the brain, right? If the size of your brain is too large and then the coil doesn't fit, then you can't do it. And also that if you have an operation, for some reasons, there are some metal materials inside your brain. No, this is a no-go, it can't go. Otherwise you die there, you will die. <laughs> this is a no-go. So the reason is, so inside the magnetic field, the metal, the, the metal, metal material will just heat up, right? The temperature will go higher and then you, yeah, it's bad. <laughs> so always, if, uh, we are researchers, we want to find participants to participate in MRI brain studies. There is a screening, screening check, ask a list of questions like going to the medical doctor. So have you, have, have you have done this? Have you have done that? Do you have this in your brain? Do you have tattoos, even piercings, for example? Take it off if possible. If not, then sorry. <laughs> this kind of restrictions. We have a quite strict rule in um, in terms of recruiting participants. We don't want to damage, we don't want to harm anyone, right? So in terms of security and safety, this is quite important. <clears throat> okay, and uh, I told, what I told you is kind of the knowledge from the past maybe 30, 40 years. And if you want to know a little bit more of what is new in terms of the MRI method, there is a paper, pretty recent one. So um, they are reviewing the history and also some developments of the method. Okay, I, I think I've covered many of the, uh, the major neuro, neuroimaging methods. So there are single neuron recordings and the brain lesions. And if we do not have the patients, we can temporarily um, do some brain virtual damage using stimulation. It can be TMS, it can be TDCS. There's also the ultrasound, ultrasonic brain stimulation. And there is also the MEG and the EEG to directly measure the brain signal, either the current, the electronic activity, electrical activity, 
or um, the related or the associated magnetic field generated by that current from your brain. And we have also the MRI. It is indirect measurement of the brain activity. It doesn't measure the brain activity per se. Instead, it measures um, the oxygen level to be uh, consumed by the brain. Because if the brain is activating, it needs brain, uh, it needs oxygen uh, for the energy. <clears throat> And so we have, for example, here, this is a large one, right? This one, MRI. And the temporal resolution is not so high, but there's a range. It depends on how fast you take the picture, right? You can take the picture um, one second, every second, or every two seconds, for example. And then here, in terms of the spatial resolution, you could also have a range of possibility. It can go maybe one by one by one, can be two by two by two, or three by three by three. So that's the possibility that is provided by the machine. And uh, so here, this is the MEG and EEG. Obviously, you can see from here, the corresponding temporal resolution is way better. So it's much more precise. It goes to milliseconds relative to MRI method. <clears throat> and the MEG and the EEG relative to here, this comparison here, so this range versus this range, you could see that the spatial resolution of MEG and EEG is a little bit um, less than MRI machine. Good. <clears throat> And then there are more methods. I will just really briefly talk about that. And you could also, um, in terms of analyzing or recording behavior, people could also record it, especially if you do developmental research. If you have a baby, for example, and you bring your baby, even within one year old, to the lab, the baby can't go to experiment on themselves, right? You have, as a parent, you have to go with the baby. And they do some task. So usually you are holding the baby, and then the experimenter will take a video to analyze, to record the behavior of the baby, and also potentially the interaction between the parent and the baby. And there could also be the pharmacological manipulation. You take some medicines and drugs or, like, or hormones and or neurotransmitters related, for example, uh, or, or, or uh, what's the word? Oxytocin, for example, uh, testosterone, for example, um, opioid, and dopamine drugs, all of them, they are, they are modulating the brain activity. And this is also a way to establish causal relationship. So if I take one drug, the brain works like this. If I don't take it, the brain works otherwise. And then the drug is manipulating some or changing, affecting some area of the, area of the brain and then hence changing the behavior. And then there is also the PET PET uh, stimulate, uh, recording, and this is quite expensive. And usually nowadays, people you don't do that anymore, any often in, uh, in healthy patients. So with all this kind of knowledge that I have introduced you from today, also from part of it um, the last week, we have a quick summary. So um, there are two distinct, there, are, there is a distinction between two terms or two terminologies, one right? is called measurements, the other one is manipulation. Let, let's take a look. So measurements, measurements, it means there are something that we can record, we could measure. So we could record which button you press. We could record how fast you are pressing the button. We could record, for example, the heart rate and then the single neuron uh, activity and also some of the brain responses with an MRI or EEG. So they are measurements. And on the other hand, we could manipulate it. So here, under, uh, we, what is to manipulate? I'll tell you later, but you, you could have a feeling at the moment. So we are using brain stimulation and in, um, in invasive stimulation even, and drug manipulation, brain lesion. This is to manipulate, okay? So here, manipulation basically means there, those are the methods to somehow change the function of the brain. And the measurement here instead is to measure how that works. This tool can be even combined. For instance, I could use TMS 
to temporarily change some functioning of the brain. And I also have to know where it's changed. I do have a special hypothesis to say, well, if I want to stimulate the motor cortex, motor behavior will be changed. But I would also like to know if it is indeed the case. And I have to measure that. One way is to use fMRI. And using fMRI, there's also the advantage to measure the connectivity of the brain. So presumably, this is kind of a, this is a brain. It's nicely, uh, not <laughs> ugly drawing, fix that in your head. So we measure the entire brain. That means we, we measure everywhere in the brain, right? If we see activation somewhere, we could be also uh, to see the connection between the areas of uh, the brain. I think I have someone at the door. I need to go a little bit, just a second. <clears throat> I think I really have to go now. So for some reason, um, I, I will stop here. Okay, is that fine? So uh, let me give 20 seconds. There's a difference between measurement and manipulation. I'm nearly done. And if you have questions, I, you can email me. I'm really sorry about that. So there's a book. You can take a look at the difference of um, the methods and also some of the interesting parts. And for the part presentation, you know the list. And then now go use the email to contact your partner and you can prepare. And then next week we are starting and new kind of interaction among us, okay? Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, I'm, yeah cool, thank you, thank you. <laughs>